Republican presidential candidate Nikki Haley says she is sticking around despite losing to Donald Trump in her own state. Still, she's not quitting the race, she says. Brian Kilmeade will join us from his radio studio. You know how we simulcast in just a moment. But first, here's Donald Trump after his victory. Today is not the end of our story. We're headed to Michigan tomorrow, and we're headed to the Super Tuesday states throughout all of next week. We'll keep fighting for America, and we won't rest until America wins. Haley also lost one of her biggest financial backers. The Koch brothers backed Americans for Prosperity, writing, we don't believe any outside group can make a material difference to widen her path to victory. The Wall Street Journal editorial board is warning that despite Donald Trump's big win, his Republican Party is divided. Here's a quote. He wins big in South Carolina but won't beat Joe Biden without Nikki Haley's voters. California Governor Gavin Newsom is among those who say Haley is helping his party. I don't know why Democrats would want her out of the race. She's one of our better surrogates. I mean, she's defining the opposition to Trump incredibly effectively. I mean, she's making points I'm applauding every single day about his temperament, his capacity, uh, his, you know, unraveling in real time. Uh, and so I think it's I think she's been incredibly effective. So I hope she stays in personally. Brian Kilmeade, Fox and Friends co-host and host of the Brian Kilmeade radio show and One Nation. Brian, I've actually heard exactly what Gavin Newsom was saying come out of your mouth. Yes, he copies me all the time, except for I would have not raised taxes like that and I would not have had dinner at the French Laundry during the pandemic. Besides that, we're very similar. Uh, Harris, a couple of things. Nikki Haley, I think, is a fine candidate, and I think she's staying in for a couple of reasons. She's staying in, number one, she wants to say, I told you so, if Trump loses. And she believes that the world of Trump and the MAGA movement, as Joe Biden has labeled it, will end if Donald Trump loses. She thinks it's going to go the way of the Tea Party. That's, I think, her hunch. That's the only thing I could think of. Because Ron DeSantis basically said, look, I agree with everything Donald Trump's doing. I'll do it better, more efficiently, without the controversy. When he seemed as though the party wasn't going to get over Trump and they wanted to make him number one, DeSantis says, OK, I'm out. When, when Governor Haley was doing the same thing, he's a friend of mine. I like working for him. This is, uh, this is my time. That was his time. That was interesting. But now she is going down. It sounds like she might as well be Bernie Sanders or Joe Biden. She's saying he's not going to beat Joe Biden, saying that he's lost it, not the same guy off the teleprompter, is too old. Really? And the chaos just follows him. So, These are Democratic arguments. So it's like she's in the Chris Christie, Liz Cheney lane, and I am just think it's a huge risk for her. Well, what Gavin Newsom said that I've heard you say is that it's helping the Democrats at this no point. Doubt. I mean, he, he basically made the point that she's defining Donald Trump in a way that they can use it. 59%, um, by the way, and, and this is just in South Carolina reportedly, um, of the people who voted for her say that they would never vote for Donald Trump. So that, that part about whether or not Donald Trump is at all paying attention or needs to pay attention to Nikki Haley right now, I guess you could argue over that. But if people would only vote for her... How many people are we talking about? And, and should he be worried about that? I think it's a couple of things. If you ask fighters before a fight, they're never going to be friends with that other guy, right? But at the end, 99% of the time, they end up hugging it out. Barack Obama and Hillary Clinton was oh, as bitter as I can remember. John McCain against George Bush, as bitter as I can remember. At the end of it, it says, well, how can I help? Now, this might take longer, but if you ask, I, I vote for Nikki Haley, I'm going up to the booth, I come out of the booth, and there's somebody with a clipboard who says, would you ever vote for Donald Trump if Nikki Haley loses? No. But to me, you could absolutely see the momentum changing come fall when Joe Biden and, uh, Joe, and Donald Trump contrast each other, let them know what the direct, different directions of the country, especially when it comes on the border, I'm pretty sure that yeah. a lot of those Haley supporters are some of the people that put her in the office twice. You don't, you know, don't really have resentment, maybe take ownership of her, because that's when she came of age as a candidate. Well, but she's really not helpful with those type of comments on Trump. We're about to see how different they are at the border, because both presidents will be at the border on Thursday, 45 and 46.
And I, I opened this hour by saying, how does it feel to follow Donald Trump? I mean, that announcement about Joe Biden was made just a, a few minutes before we went to air. It, it's going to be an interesting situation to watch them. One man saying what I did work, the other man saying what I did didn't work, but I'm going to try to fix it by executive order before I have to tell the nation what the status of it is, the State of the Union. Um, and it, go, go ahead. Go ahead. Uh, well, my feeling on this is, too, I don't need Donald Trump's speech and Joe Biden's speech. I was in America at the time. I know what <laughs> yeah. was working. And when things weren't working for Donald Trump, you know what he did? He acknowledged it and he fired people. And then he sit there mm -hmm. and said, I want you to go to those other countries where they're coming from, and I want you to take their aid away. And I want you to tell them there's going to be incentives if you can crack down on your country. And I'm going to go tell Mexico, even though you're a socialist, I bet you're going to do business with you. You're going to stay in Mexico. And that's what's going to happen. In return, I'm not going to put tariffs on you. So I know this. I don't need a 30-second ad. I know it worked. And when Joe Biden puts in the executive orders he's rumored to, to do, he will defy his own words that said well, that nothing I can do to control this has to be done through Congress. So you have a bunch of bad options, Mr. President, and you're all you're, you're all right. coming to the border two times in three years is not great. Uh, let's add this to the mix. Critics are railing against sportscaster Bob Costas, who said this about former President Trump and his supporters on CNN this weekend. Let's watch. He is by far the most disgraceful figure in modern presidential history. He's only become more disgraceful since 2016 and since 2020. He is a bubbling cauldron of loathsome traits. You have to be in the throes of some sort of toxic delusion in an toxic cult to believe that Donald Trump has ever been in any sense emotionally, psychologically, intellectually or ethically fit to be president. Brian. I know Bob Costas. I know how bright he is. Best sport. When, by the time he was 34, he was the best sportscaster in the country doing all the biggest events ever. I know that's exactly how he feels. But I think it's so, it's so shallow of him to think that you can have your feelings and put down 74 million people mm. along the way. If people if you, who are supported, especially him coming from a place where people support their teams and their players and their boxers and, and their athletes, mm -hmm. and people are, are loyal. There are people loyal to him for reasons they should be respected for and analyzed. Because but once everybody again, that's should be Hillary, respected. Right. Like, I and mean, that's Democrats Hillary want playbook. their voters to be respected. Can you imagine if a Republican candidate called them all deplorable? I mean, come on. They and did. this has been going on for years. I, I want to get to this because I know you have some, some thoughts on it. So Republicans on former President Bush or uh, former President Trump's VP shortlist making their cases to voters over the weekend. Let's watch. The Republican primary is over, and Donald Trump is our nominee. I was one of the first people to endorse Donald J. Trump. I'm proud to be the first member of Congress to endorse President Trump. Any super PAC or C4 or whatever entity that supported me during that campaign, I'm publicly calling on them to use their resources to support Donald J. Trump. There's a reason why they're so afraid of him, because he poses a threat to this establishment. we got to have leadership that's going to say tough things when we need to hear them. And we have that leadership this November in Donald J. Trump. Republicans at CPAC were asked for their top pick for vice president. The straw poll found that South Dakota Governor Kristi Noem and Vivek Ramaswamy tied for first place, followed by Tulsi Gabbard, House Republican Chair Elise Stefanik, and South Carolina Senator Tim Scott. Brian. Those people way to the right are not going to help the president. He's already got them. He needs people that are somewhat open to understand that that vice presidential slot is probably the leading candidate to be the next president because he's four and out. Got so it? who? So my feeling is it's Elise Stefanik. And the second one would be Tim Scott, just judging by the thing that President Trump has been saying about Tim Scott. And Tim Scott's one of the most respected people I know. Anyone that knows him just has great respect for him. He still gets high marks in South Carolina, around the country, even across the aisle. But if I, was, if I said right now, I believe Elise Stefanik would deliver it. They're also, the president in the back of his head still thinks he's got a shot at New York, and she could yeah. help galvanize upstate New York and overcome maybe some resistance that hurt Lee Zeldin in the city. Now he's got the New York Jewish vote that more open to a Republican candidate uh, after what we're seeing going on right now. Uh, mm -hmm. So I think this could really go her way. I've never seen more candidates say, I want it. No one's playing coy, Harris. No one's well, saying, look, well, I, I love the fact that people want to lead this country. 
because it's a mess. And if they're yes. Americans who love America that much, let, let's see all of them. There's nothing wrong with that. That's, that's what's great about America. We always have a future. God bless us all. Uh, Brian, I have to let you go or your, your producers are, are going to leave me nasty, Graham. So, um, no, no, it's you okay. You got a commercial that's, that's about Thanks to run so out. Thanks so much, Harris Faulkner. Great to see you. Thank you. Hey, everyone. I'm Emily Campagno. Catch me and my co-hosts, Harris Faulkner and Kaylee McEnany on Outnumbered every weekday at 12 p.m. Eastern or set your DVR. Also, don't forget to subscribe to the Fox News YouTube page for daily highlights.